The United States of America is the richest country in the world, but it also has the world's largest national debt at 34 trillion US dollars. If lenders were to ask for all of this money back at once, it would bankrupt the country, and so it's important to know who owns it and why a country so wealthy thinks that borrowing is smarter than investing. Subscribe to see the start of something new here. And speaking of something new, here is a map of the top 30 countries when measured by debt to GDP. This is the debt owned by the government compared to the size of the economy, and you can see this seems to be concentrated in Europe, because even though there are different approaches across Western Europe about how much debt is right, they're all very high in a global sense. You can see the US and Canada are both up there as well, but then you see Japan? I didn't realize you could get debt to GDP at 222.2%. Are you okay? Why do some countries choose to load themselves up with so much debt? Well, it's not the only choice, because some countries aren't in any debt at all, like East Timor, and some even have the reverse of it in the case of sovereign wealth funds where they effectively have negative debt to GDP ratios. Money now is fun, but as everyone knows, borrowing and debt comes with interest payments. Wouldn't it be great though if instead someone else paid you interest for your money? This is effectively what sovereign wealth funds are, investing in assets that generate a return, meaning that taxes are reduced via the returns from them, instead of increased from the burden of paying back past debt. If these returns are themselves invested, then you can end up with even more growth and even more money for the nation. Compounding returns are the infinite money glitch of the finance world, and these countries started doing it on a very serious level. Norway is the most famous and public example of this, but countries like the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia are investing their natural resource money to ensure that when the oil runs dry and there are no dinosaur bones left in the ground, they'll still have oil wealth. This is analogous to a football player making $50 million a year. They can make a lifestyle out of it, or they could invest the majority and ensure that when they get too old to be useful, they'll still have an income source. Countries like Zambia didn't make this decision, and so when copper fell in price, so too did every part of their public sector. So always invest and never borrow sounds like the right path for a nation, right? Borrowing money and having no savings sounds like terrible financial advice, so why do so many countries do it? Well, in the same way that investing makes sense for an individual usually, so too can debt. Investing in an appreciating asset that you'll also live in is something almost everyone agrees is a good idea. And the nation equivalent of this might be investing 100 million in a railway that will generate more in profit and tickets than the cost of the debt used to build it. Even crazier than this is the fact that even if these projects don't make direct economic sense to any individual, they can also grow an economy enough to be worthwhile. Even if you only made 4 million in tickets, but the train link encourages 6 million in new economic development, it would still be smarter to borrow the money than not. Some infrastructure projects around the world are such good bets that it'd be insane for the government not to build them, but then why do countries invest in British property or stocks instead of their own tunnels and railway links and airports? Well, there are three good reasons actually, and the simplest and the first is just that if you you had some spare money, you might have a business you can invest in, you might be able to buy a new oven for your bakery for example, but if you don't have a bakery or any form of business, it's better to invest the money at the bank than to desperately search around for something to buy for your current business. If you don't own a bakery or your bakery already has enough ovens, then you probably shouldn't be investing in that bakery and those ovens. The reason number two is better returns. This is one of the reasons why China will lend money to other nations who are less developed, because once you build the most obvious bridges, railways, and ports in your country, which China has long since done, you might make more money by building the same in other countries. Just, you know, don't ask the other reasons that China is giving lots of money to many poorer nations. And the third reason is overheating. This is what happens when an economy grows too fast, faster than there is capacity to absorb. Even if there is a great project to invest in, and even if it makes perfect sense for you to do so, it might be that your economy is already stretched to the max. If you have full employment already, if every everyone is already working in a job, then building new infrastructure projects won't create new economic development, but will instead simply raise wages and arguably inflation. This is something which is a very commonly cited economic reason not to invest. However, as best I can tell, even though this is the most commonly cited reason though, after looking into it, almost no country has actually gone through overheating and the opposite is much more common. Uh, indeed, if you are to type in Norway overheating, you'll find out about their extreme heat waves. But anyway, those are the three big reasons the governments might not 
not invest in their own economy, even if they have the money. And so if you've got some spare cash and you can't be spending it on your own citizens because it's not going to be productive, what else can you do? Well, funnily enough, as an individual or as a government, one of the best sources of investment is government debt. This is the truly safest investment because unlike your friend who swears he'd pay you back but just has no money slash is really buying Xbox games and cigarettes and just hoping you'll forget, countries always have the means to pay you back as they usually have the ability to print more money as a means of last resort. This ability to always pay you back makes it an incredibly cheap source of debt for the government in question but also makes it a reliable source of returns for someone who is looking to turn their small money pile into a slightly bigger one. So the big questions this raises are who buys this government debt, which countries are going out there and investing in other countries, and also which countries have a sovereign wealth fund, which countries are making money, versus which ones are on the borrowing end of the spectrum. You might have briefly seen that map of the different countries by their debt to GDP earlier, but what does this look like on the other side of the equation? Well, let's get classic 2 cap for a second and take a second to look at the sovereign wealth funds by value. There's just three categories here, greater than 100 billion, less than 100 billion, and less than 20 billion. And let's be real, when we're talking about debt, which is measured in trillions, in the US's case, tens of trillions, on the worldwide scale, it's hundreds of trillions, uh, having 20 billion in a sovereign wealth fund is basically like having next to nothing. And then let's also say that a sovereign wealth fund in, say, China doesn't really count because it's not a natural resource fund. It's not because they have some resource there. It's because they need to, for all the trade they do, have a bunch of currency. And so they just loan out their currency reserves. It's not a true system. And even if it was, having a trillion dollars when you've got over a billion people is just under a thousand dollars per person. Whereas a trillion dollars in Norway is, oh, that's a lot, lot more money per person. So I think if you take this exact same approach and we really rule things down to natural resource funds, here are the list of natural resource funds in the planet. What do these places actually have in common though? Um, again, if we really, really were to say like, well, the wealthiest ones, the really, really successful ones, uh, really comes down to like, well, you've got like Brunei over there, you've got like Saudi Arabia, Russia and Norway, uh, and then, uh, you know, some of, some of ones over here. What do these places actually have in common? And funnily enough, you can tell this with a simple Google Maps check. Here is what Saudi Arabia looks like. How much life do you think there is? How, how many people do you think live precisely here? Or indeed, within a five mile radius of here, I would be willing to bet it's very, very low. Though there's some little fun circles here. That's a weird thing you find all across the desert. But, uh, you know, like ultimately, if you look at Norway and you zoom into most of its country, you'll see it's the same. How many people live here? It's not very habitable terrain. And then we'll do the same with Russia. Uh, you know, anyone can do this. All, basically anywhere in Russia, it's like, how, to, how, how is this a country of 100 million people? They they all live in the major population centers. And so, uh, yeah, with the countries that aren't very, very inhospitable for most of its terrain, it's because they have very little to begin with. Looking at Brunei on a map, in case you've never done so, you'll realize that it's a country that just has very little land area, and most of that is national reserves of some form, and ultimately could be settled, but still would lead to a population which can double or triple at most, whereas the population potential in countries like China, uh, they still could have another couple uh, billion people if they really settled the West. Uh, the USA has the potential for billions more people, and the same is true for basically any country that they could fit tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of more people, but certain countries are very close to their natural peak. And so it might almost seem like what I'm saying here is, wait, so the fewer people in the country, the more money you have? That is entirely uh, counter to how the world actually works, because the richest country in the world has the third highest population, and the second richest country in the world has the very highest. And so, no, actually, Toycat, you must be wrong there. But here's the interesting thing. Thing. If you have very few people in your country, whether by force or by choice, usually by accident, but uh, when you have very few people in your country, if you discover natural resources, those tend to go a lot further. Take Norway and the United Kingdom, for example, which share the North Sea. I mean, technically, so do these countries down here, but no Norway and the UK have the majority of the North Sea between them, and so hypothetically, if there was oil to be found there, not a hypothetical, uh, then most of that, mo that that money could be split, maybe evenly based on uh, where the oil was found. If it was very close to 50-50, uh, that result would have Norway making a lot more money per person, about 10 times more than the United Kingdom, because the United Kingdom, fun fact, you, you, this will blow your minds, has way more people than Norway. <laughs> I know, a shocking fact, but this means that the per person effect is massively felt more in Norway. In the UK, it wasn't invested in a sovereign wealth fund. It's debated 
what happened to the oil money, but ultimately there was a lot of oil money. There still is in the UK. It's just in general, it is part of our government revenue, whereas in Norway, they use it specifically for their magic fund. And uh, th w w what this magic fund is useful for is a hotly contentious issue. But the fact is, Norway with a low population density would find it very hard to invest that money in a meaningful way and also has a lot more of it per person. So using it to uh, have a safe fund for the future, using it to make sure that Norway will continue to be rich even uh, once all their industry is gone actually seems very, very smart. And so these, uh, and ultimately this is the decision that lots of these countries are choosing to make. Um, when you have very few people and you have a lot of natural resource money, the natural resource money goes further per person. Ultimately, if you think about it, if you're going to make money from people interacting with each other, the usual way business works, you want as many people as possible. But if you're going to have natural resources, you want to share them with as few people as possible. If there was, uh, you know, if there was oil found underneath my house, I, uh, 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 but like, or rather this whole area right here, let's just say, because I live on the new era estate, you can probably trust that's true. But if I lived on the new era estate, this area right here, and there was oil found underneath my home, it'd be in my interest that as few other people share that oil money, because if it's 10 million pounds, that'd be a lot for me. But if it's 10 million pounds split between the thousand people that live on the top of the oil, it becomes very little per person, is the simple way to put that in other words. And so, yeah, if you actually look at what all of the countries have in common, it's population density. The number of people per square kilometer, it goes drastically down in Norway, Saudi Arabia. You can barely see over there, but you can see that, uh, that, that the, the only ex exceptions to population density are countries that are so small that they have few people to begin with. And so if you want to have a lot of sovereign wealth money, the, the only exception here seems to be the USA. And you might say, well, that proves it. You don't just need to have few people, except if we then sort by uh, subdivision, you can see that, oh, the oil happens to be found in these very green areas with very few people and taking a look at the natural resource funds. Wow, it just so happens they also have these funds too. When you have very few people and you have a resource, which is the same amount of value, whether there's a thousand of you or a hundred thousand of you, the fewer of you there is, the more money you have per person, which is what leads to the wild amounts of money that can exist in these sovereign wealth funds. Again, you know, saying a greater than 100 billion really is selling Norway, Saudi Arabia, and Dubai short. Because when you take a glance at those figures again, you'll realize just how high these truly are and how they're truly in a league of their own. However, they still don't quite add up to the US debt total. And in fact, even weirder is the fact that even though the US is so much in debt, none of these countries, the ones who should be creditors because they've got so much money, are in the big lender category. In fact, when you look at the biggest creditors, you'll find by country, it is Japan, and then China, and then the United Kingdom, that's a surprise, as well as Belgium and Luxembourg making up the top five. These are not countries that are heavily wealthy and have huge amounts of money sitting in accounts that they just happen to invest in the US, but instead countries that are in debt in their own right. So how exactly does that work? Well, interestingly, the majority of any given government debt is actually owned by individuals of some caliber, particularly in some Asian countries where long-term savings are seen as preferable to stocks. This is what leads to the list of foreign owners of US debt having a Asian bias in that way, but it is also what makes it possible for countries like Japan with such high debt to still be lending out money. In fact, one of the reasons Japan can support such a high debt to GDP ratio, something that would crush literally every other country on the planet, is because they have a large category of borrowers who are willing to fund the Japanese government, not just individually, but as institutions, because there are a lot of those large institutions that need solid returns on long time frames. You need to do your due diligence for your investors, otherwise there will be legal consequences from the government. And so if you invest in the government, you know that either the government does well and you get your returns and everyone's a winner, or the government goes away and so too do your obligations. And from that perspective, it actually makes a fair amount of sense. However, this also means there are some fun alternatives to government debt. Sometimes you want to invest in the government so bad, but you don't want the pitifully low returns, and the government doesn't want a debt which has to be called in and paid at some point, and so an alternative can be arranged. Some of these are incredibly lucrative, like when Chicago sold the rights to its streets. This sounds wild, but when you park on the street in the city of Chicago, you pay a price, and that price goes to Abu Dhabi. They have already made up their money back, and they've got years left remaining on it, effectively meaning they sort of own Chicago's streets, because if there is any 
any work that needs to be done on them, they're getting their money regardless because of the incredibly favorable lease terms. A similar deal applies to the Toronto 407. The 401 is the widest highway in North America with 22 lanes at its widest point, and it's crazy because it's in Canada, a place that you wouldn't associate that with. However, Canada did build a second highway, but to cover the costs, they sold the rights to the toll, a highway with 60 plus dollars in tolls, by the way, with the revenue owned by private companies, some of whom are overseas too. Also, Heathrow Airport is another great example. It's an airport with very high landing fees, notoriously so, but it's partially owned by the Saudi Arabia Sovereign Wealth Fund. Oh, that's a fun loop, huh? Comes right back to the sovereign wealth funds again, because when another country buys your airport, highway, or city streets, the worst they can do is sell it. But what happens when they buy your debt and then decide they want the money back? The big fear of many people is this, and so what happens if it happens to your debt? Well, just like with your dodgy friend, the government won't pay you back if you ask for your money. Funnily enough, when you buy a government bond, you're actually buying the rights for the government to pay you back in 5 to 30 years with an interest payment every 6 months or a year until then. This is made at the coupon rate and basically the more risky government debt is looking, the higher they have to make this coupon rate, the higher the interest payments are and the more of your taxes go to paying people's interest as opposed to, you know, paying for things the government has to use. This legal requirement to only pay the interest is what makes government debt so stable and why so many countries can be stretched to the point that they're barely even paying the interest because when a bond comes due, they can just immediately pay it by selling a new bond and as long as they have the fees to cover the interest on that, you can continually and perpetually finance your government via bonds to cover your bonds to cover your bonds to cover your bonds to cover something that you probably did 200 years ago. This means that governments can borrow amounts in the trillions because they only need to pay back the interest. Conversely, for an investor, they can be paid from the most stable entity in your country backed by the taxes you or I pay. Effectively, this is the same as a person buying shares in a highway or an airport, except they're buying the right to some percentage of your taxes cool or depressing, I guess, but ultimately that is what stops a country from calling in the debt and that is how government debt works. I hope you found part one of how countries work to be interesting because I look forward to seeing you for part two in a couple of weeks. Thank you for watching. Second channel, don't care. Bye.